Greetings, fellow constant readers. You are listening or watching The Company of the Mad, The Stand podcast. I'm your host, Jason Seacrest, and I am joined by quite a distinguished panel. I am so excited to have them all here, and I cannot wait to introduce them to you. But before I do, a disclaimer. Ladies and gentlemen, on this podcast, we will be discussing Stephen King's epic novel, The Stand. For this episode, specifically chapters 1 through 24. For those of you who have not yet read The Stand, there may be spoilers ahead, and so we encourage each and every one of you to take The Stand Challenge and read along with us each month. We're also super excited to hear your thoughts, so as you are reading, drop us a line by using hashtag The Stand Challenge on Twitter, Instagram, or whatever is your preferred playground for reading biased news and checking in on your exes. A second disclaimer, if you are listening to The Stand Podcast on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or any other such audio-only platform, why? Why would you do that when you can come over to thestandpodcast.com and watch the video of our little soiree? Then you can see our gorgeous faces and join in on all of the fun that we'll be having as we discuss a super flu that destroys the majority of the human race. While you're at thestandpodcast.com, scroll down and give a donation to the EMS FDNY Help Fund. Your donation will help those on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. The EMS FDNY Help Fund is putting supplies in the hands of those who need them and providing relief to those infected while working on the front lines in New York City. Mike Flanagan is with us. He is the writer and director of such Stephen King film adaptations as Dr. Sleep and Gerald's Game, as well as the hit Netflix TV show, The Haunting of Hill House. He is currently finishing up production on Netflix's The Haunting of Bly Manor. Tanana Reeve Dew is a novelist and the producer of Shudder's Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. She teaches black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA, and you can take her online digital download course, The Sunken Place, by going to tananareevedu.com. I'm going to take it. You should too. Tanana Reeve has been reading Stephen King books since she was a little girl. She'll talk with us a bit about that later in the hour. And she has played with Stephen King on stage as part of the Rock Bottom Remainders. Anthony Bresnikin is an author and journalist who has worked as a reporter for just about everyone. The Arizona Republic, <laughs> Associated Press, USA Today, and Entertainment Weekly, just to name a few. Bresnikin's debut novel, Brutal Youth, is a funny, tough, and heartbreaking book about the darker side of growing up. It received high praise from critics and peers alike, including Stephen King, who provided a blurb for the novel's dust jacket. Bresnikin is currently the Los Angeles correspondent with Vanity Fair. I'm your host, Jason Seacrest. I write scary stuff, and I write about scary stuff as well. I'm an author of horror fiction, and I write a column for King's limited edition publishers called What I Learned from Stephen King, exploring the wisdom, life lessons, and spirituality in King's many works. You can hear me read those columns to you and get all my horror fiction when you subscribe at patreon.com slash Jason Seacrest. Now, that's a hard name to spell, and to not read do isn't that much easier. So you'll find the links to all these things and more at thestandpodcast.com, right under the Meet the Panel section. Okay, so since this is the first episode, before we dive right into talking about this month's chapters, I'd like to take a moment to get to know each of you a little bit better. So I'm going to ask each of you two questions starting with Mr. Flanagan. How did you first come to love Stephen King? And when was the first time you read The Stand? Oh, well, I, uh, I think I, I first fell in love with Stephen King. I was, I was in uh, fifth grade-ish, and the, the first King book that I, that I read was It. Um, I really kind of jumped into the deep end on it. And, and I had been, uh, growing up, I read a lot of John Belair's and then R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike. Uh, but I was terrified of scary movies. I couldn't handle scary movies. And I thought 
rather naively that if I instead would focus on scary books, that would be better because I could control the experience and I could shut the book. Um, and because I wasn't seeing it and hearing it and being startled, you know, on screen, it would, it would be less traumatic. And I was completely wrong about that. Um, so I started with it and uh, I didn't want to keep reading it. it. It was so upsetting, but I loved the characters so much that I didn't have a choice. And uh, so I kind of endured this huge novel um, that was utterly unlike anything I'd ever read and, you know, simultaneously kind of traumatized me and opened my eyes to horror fiction. And, and by the end of it, I felt like I had survived this ordeal with the Losers Club. And from then on, I was, I was a, a King fanatic. Uh, and The Stand, I read, um, my, my introduction to The Stand was, I, I, I watched Mick Garris's miniseries when it first aired and loved it. And uh, it was a few years later, I finally got around to reading the book. And I haven't read it since then, um, which would have been, I would have been in high school, I think, when I read that. That was in the 90s, um, I think, right? Like when, when the yeah. miniseries came out? Yes. And, and I, uh, it must have been a year or two after I saw the miniseries that I finally read the book and, uh, and, and loved it, but I hadn't picked it up again because um, I, I tried to burn my way through the entire Stephen King um, catalog. I, I tried to read his whole library and that took years and years and years. <laughs> so uh, I, I, this is the first time I've circled back to the stand. Have you read everything? Have you read everything by Stephen King at this point? Yes. Yes, wow. I have. That's incredible. Yeah. That is absolutely amazing. So Nana Reeve, what about, uh, what about you? What, was the, what, how, what made you fall in love with Stephen King and when was the first time that you read The Stand? Well, I grew up with a, my late mother, Patricia Stevens Dew, who loved horror, which is kind of funny. She was a civil rights activist. so She was known as a very serious minded person, but she basically raised me and my sisters on those old universal horror <laughs> movies, The Creature from the Black Lagoon uh, and, and The Mummy and The Fly and all this stuff. So I got my love of horror for her, uh, from her rather, and she bought me my first Stephen King novel when I was in high school. That would have been The Shining, is, is my memory of it. And as an aspiring writer, especially one who had never read horror, you know, I had been exposed to cinematic horror, but I had never, maybe I had read The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, maybe, that's about it. I had never read, I can't think of any horror literature I had read. So. The Shining just rocked my world. It was um, a masterclass, as all of King's work is, on, on building characters that, that readers will love. So it didn't matter that there weren't any characters in The Shining who reminded me of me or seemed like me. You know, there, were, there was no little girl or anything like that, but I was in the Overlook Hotel. I was with those characters. He even mentioned my favorite TV show, Emergency, at the time. <laughs> wow. So, I almost fell out of my bed when I read that. It was like the book had reached into my life and grabbed me by the hair. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. So the stand came a bit later. I'm guessing I was still in high school. So it was, I'm not gonna say what year, but it was a while back. And I was sick when I read it, which is an issue I'm dealing with now, but not because I'm sick, but because I'm afraid of getting sick uh, during a, an infection. So I had, either a flu or a cold while I was reading it. And I thought every symptom I read in the book, I had, I had Captain Trips. So it's kind of funny to be doing this book club right now. <laughs> because oh my gosh. The, the Stand is the last book I would have picked up at this particular moment in history, just because, you know, when things first started, we all thought it was kind of fun to watch Contagion and all the pandemic yeah. movies. And I was recommending uh, my short stories I've written about pandemic. I have one called Herd Immunity I keep recommending. But in recent weeks, it's been all about the hypochondria, you know, like sitting up my temperature with stress. <laughs> so it is really, really hard <laughs> for me to, watch, to read The Stand right now. But, but also, like Mike, I haven't read it since high school. So it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating comparing then and now, seeing the masterwork in terms of creating characters, uh, which is what I feel like Stephen King was almost like my personal writing instructor on that, because it was like, yes, that's what I want. I want my characters to be so real that even people who don't like horror have to read my book because they have to find out what happens next. <laughs> I love that. 
That's perfect. That's what you strive for, as right. Yeah. That's absolutely perfect. Um, Anthony, what about you? How did you come to love Stephen King, and when did you first read The Stand? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, I, you were kind enough to mention my book and the shout out I got from him. But look who else has a really great oh. shout out. Tanana Reeve book, My Soul to Keep. And uh, I love her books. And so it's a pleasure to be with her and Mike and you to talk about this. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, okay, so I, I got into Stephen King when I was about 12 or 13. I went to the... Uh, I loved going to movies and I went to see a movie with my friend and there was a trailer for Pet Cemetery, and I was not into horror. I wasn't into Freddy or Jason or any of that stuff at that point. This would have been like the like 1988 or something. And, uh, but there was something about the trailer for that that just looked so cool. I love the idea of there being this thing in the woods, this little burial ground, you know, that you, you could explore and find the, these sort of ruins out there. And, and the old guy kind of reminded me of my grandfather. <laughs> you know, I, I just felt like drawn to this story. But because it was an R-rated horror film and I was 12 years old, no adult would take me to see it. And my grandmother said, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with her and she said, you know, that's a, that's, that's a book by this guy named Stephen King. How about if we buy you the book? And I was so disappointed to get a, <laughs> a reading assignment. <laughs> I just wanted to watch the movie. And, reluctantly okay fine I guess I'll read this book and um uh she bought it for me I still have it I have it in a little glass box it's all beat up and torn and, and falling apart um this old paperback of a uh, pet cemetery and uh it reading it um it, it it gave me a sense of power as a kid uh at that age nothing you do is uh, your own will. You're told what to dress, where to be, when to speak, when not to, when to eat. Like you're constantly being bossed around. But I was really impressed that this guy, Stephen King, could write a story and, and using nothing except words, make me believe things and make me see things and make me feel things. And I really wanted that. And, and, and I was kind of a lost kid. I was, you know, troubled and, and didn't have the greatest home life. But writing really gave me a sense of control that I could I could write a story and it might be bad, but it's not wrong. And so I would write my little ghost stories and, uh, and then the girl I liked in eighth grade knew that I liked Stephen King and she bought me It, the paperback for It, which was um, as a Christmas present. So like that, those were my first two books by him. And then I would, you know, I would scrape together cash, whatever money I could find in the couch cushions or on top of the dryer that fell out of the clothes doing the laundry. Like I would scrape together, Six ninety nine, and when we would go to the Giant Eagle grocery store, um, I would if I had enough for a paperback, I would buy them. So uh, I gradually collected whatever they had uh, available, Christine, and then the Stand. So I think I read the Stand probably was about the fifth or sixth book of his that I read, um, and uh, and and that's the I used to. I used to read them so much that I would put the contact paper on the outside to keep them from falling apart. <laughs> and so that's what's holding this one together. One of the ones I bought at the grocery store. That's a great cover that you have there too, that uh, artist uh, yeah. Don Brodigam did. I mean, that's one of the best covers of the sand that there is. You also, you, you had quite a bit of uh, great news that you were able to, to break this week, didn't you, Anthony? Yeah, well, uh, you know, ever since they began work on this uh, a a new adaptation of The Stand, I, I wanted to uh, learn more about it, see some imagery, and uh, at Vanity Fair, we did the first look of The Stand. Uh, it's part that's of our amazing. new TV issue that's coming out. And, uh, you know, so we have it in print, but then we also put a bunch of images and a, and a story online. I talked to, S to Steve about it. We can call him Steve here. We're all friends, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I talked to the showrunners and Whoopi Goldberg and Odessa Young, who plays Franny. Whoopi, of course, plays Mother Abigail. And uh, yeah, it was great. It was, it, the story really went, went wild this week. Uh, so uh, that was a lot of fun to, to, to share something with the, the Stephen King fans out there. That's amazing. And if people want to see the first look at the new miniseries of The Sand, they can go to VanityFair.com. Mm -hmm. That's right. Awesome. Amazing. The, the first, um, I would say that for me, the first time that I uh, fell in love with Stephen King was probably at, uh, I was about 10 years old when I read It. 
And I read it because uh, I had seen the miniseries with uh, Tim Curry scaring the living hell out of me, uh, popping up in the storm drain. I was one of those kids who, you know, the amazing thing about that miniseries is that it, it aired at a time time slot where kids were still awake, which was unheard of at that time. And it was like, it was no kid could talk about anything at school the next day, except Stephen King's It. I mean, it was, it was utterly terrifying. And I, I, I raced out and bought uh, the paperback with Tim Curry's glaring face, you know, on, on the cover and uh, was terrified just to hold it. And yet also felt this strange sense of protection as I was holding it. And um, I, I was, I, I, if there had been a losers club at my school, I would have been happy to join. I mean, it was, that's definitely the kind of kid that I was when I was growing up. And uh, it, I, I think that it also taught me a lot about the power of metaphor in that Pennywise is sort of this representation of fear and can, can take the form of whatever it is that scares you. And that was so powerful to me. You know, I mean, I'd read, I'd been a voracious reader from a really young age. My stepfather was the kind of man who would give me uh, the old man in the sea to read when I was seven years old. Like it was ridiculous. And I, one. It's <laughs> yeah, exa that's what, literally exactly what he said. And I was like, I don't understand half the words in this. So he gave me a dictionary and said, then look them up. So it, I had been reading, I'd been reading books like that since I was very young, but I'd never, I didn't want to be a writer until I read Stephen King. It seemed like his characters were the first that I, felt the most able to relate to. And so um, in school, when I was 10, our teachers uh, had us write a letter to our hero. And I chose as my hero, Stephen King. And I sent him this letter. And along with the letter, I sent him the first short horror story that I'd ever written, which was all of about two pages long. And he, I was shocked to come home from school one day and um, find a lovely postcard from him in, uh, in the, he used to send out these typed postcards that he would sign. And he was so kind and so generous and encouraged me to keep writing. And I think that that response gave me the confidence to keep, to never stop writing, to do exactly what he told me and never stop writing. And I, you know, I think without that, you know, five years later, five years after that, I became a published journalist at 15 years old for Cine Fantastique and Femme Fatale's magazine and that sort of thing. And I don't think that I would have done that at that young of an age if I hadn't had that kind of encouragement. Um, so that was, that was sort of where I first started reading Stephen King. And then the truth is, is that I didn't read The Stand until a few years ago, but there's such a massive difference between reading The Stand a few years ago and reading The Stand now. Like it's, it, it feels to me completely different. When I read The Stand before, it seemed like it was a fantasy novel. It seemed like a post-apocalyptic fantasy. And now as I'm reading it, it's like, uh, this feels like it could happen tomorrow. Um, it makes it all the more terrifying. In fact, in the first 24 chapters that we've just finished reading, I think maybe the only real fantastical element of it is uh, the Randall flag levitating off the ground. You know, I, I don't think there's a single thing that I can think of in the rest of the novel that is fantasy. And it's just, it's just so, uh, it's so much more terrifying to read it now than it was then. Did you, Tanana Reeve, did you find there to be a difference uh, reading it now than when you read it when you were a little girl? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, it feels like it's ripped from the headlines, you yeah, know, and, totally. and so many elements. There are some differences, like the government crackdown looks different, thank goodness, <laughs> in the world of the stand than it does in our lives. But also, we do have, you know, attempts by the government to kind of downplay it, like early on, downplay the disease, and, uh, and we're still having trouble getting enough tests. So we do have a government that is hostile to the truth in the way that the government in the book is hostile to the truth, except in the, in the book, it's more violent, and it involves murdering citizens and, and mm -hmm. murdering uh, people who, who dissent. So 
But aside from that, it is, yeah, it's, it's the stuff of nightmares. And what I find, especially what really pops out for me as sort of an online activist is one of the, the places that has become a real hotbed, unfortunately, for infection is in our prison system. You know, and there was recently uh, an article saying that in some prisons, like where they tested up to 65% of the inmates were testing uh, positive for, for COVID-19. And this is a huge, huge crisis. And as a kid, I didn't pay much attention to those guys in the jail cell. You know, they were a-holes, right? <laughs> we, we don't like them. They were mean to Nick. But as I'm rereading it now, <laughs> I'm feeling like that, that, that parallel, you know, okay, yeah, they're a-holes, but you don't get the death penalty for beating somebody up and stealing their money, right? And, and it's kind of that, that same um, parallel that we're seeing in our, our prison system. And I don't even believe in the death penalty, but even if I did, it's not a death penalty offense to do what the vast majority of prisoners have done. So to leave the elderly, the infirm, the immunocompromised, people who are just close to getting out but but can't get permission to get out there, there's just so many horror stories yeah. coming out of that so that has just really jumped out at me sort of how the i think almost accidentally really um this novel has brought to light a very serious social issue as we're facing the real life pandemic and that jumped out a lot anthony did you feel that it was different this time around reading it a little bit i thought um for all the things that Tanana Reeve just said, yeah, you start to notice little things jumping out. Even at one point, um, some someone is outside and they hear birds twittering. And I was like, oh, Twitter. Twitter even <laughs> makes an appearance in 1978. <laughs> um, but uh, the way uh, the way people are uh, uh, are grasping at information as the virus is spreading in the book reminds me a lot of the way we did in March. You know, I had friends who were sick in New York who thought, well, maybe this uh, hydrochloroquine is the, is the cure. I need to get some. Like, my doctor has prescribed it, but I can't get it unless I get a test. And there's this uncertainty. And now we're hearing, well, maybe that medicine isn't really what you should be taking. Maybe that makes it worse. And, you know, you should wear a mask. You should not wear a mask. Now you should wear a mask again. Like, there's there's so much back and forth and I think the confusion and the, the, the fear that comes from not knowing is, um, is, is what really stood out as being very prescient on his part. You know, I think, I think one of the things that makes him a, a great storyteller is that he's very empathetic and that he knows how people feel, including how people who are cruel feel, like how they act toward people. I thought one of the really shocking things in the book is uh, some of the casual racism that the characters express. And sometimes I think that's because he goes inside the head of a not very nice person, but then you see Larry Underwood's mom saying some pretty rotten stuff. Uh, she has a problem with black people and Puerto Rican people. And, and, uh, and I think, I don't, I don't believe that, that, that Steve is like that, you know, but I think he's aware of how people are good and bad and the uh, ugliness that is within seemingly decent people and the decency that's sometimes in bad people. And I think that's what this whole book is actually about. Because as we know, and we're getting maybe a little ahead of our 200 pages here, but uh, the, the plague is really only the first third of the book. And the rest is about what happens when you have no rules when there is no society and nobody's keeping you in line, when you can do anything you want, what do you do? And some people are drawn to still do the right thing, to still do what's good for other people, what's generous or what's self-sacrificing. And then others are like, now's my chance to take what I want and live how I feel like. And, and, and if that means being cruel or that means being selfish, then so be it. Uh, very few of those people, of the evil people in the book are, uh, are like Lloyd, you know, like a thrill kill, <laughs> a serial killer. They're often just sort of ordinary people who are indulging their dark side or their mean side or their selfish side. And, uh, and even Lloyd himself at times, you see him questioning maybe as, as the book will go on, whether, he's, whether he really wants to be on this team or not. But I thought that the, 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 the college thugs that, uh, that Tanana Reeve brought up who beat up Nick and, and you know, 
pleading to get out. Uh, you know, they have a, they, they have, they, I don't know, I wouldn't say they're redeemed, but they're definitely sorry for what they did, you know, and, uh, and they don't want to die. And they, and I think it's nice that they, when he does finally let them out, that they don't attack him, you know, he's afraid of that. And they, instead they are true to their word, like if they want to go out and, and, and then they get out into their dead town and they can't believe what they see. So, uh, I think that's what stands out for me. And, and when I wrote about the series, that's what I tried to explore is that he didn't call it the plague. It's not called the virus. It's not called the end of the whole mess. That's a different story. <laughs> uh, it's called the stand and it's about standing up and doing what's right. And uh, uh, I think that's really what he, he's interested in time and again in his books. It is interesting. I, I was thinking as, as you were saying that, that there's, there's sort of a thread that goes through at least, I think I noticed it at the end of chapter three, uh, but it probably goes on for longer than that. Um, there's this sense of, um, you know, uh, Norm is angry because his wife, because they're so poor that his wife mm -hmm. has to go babysit for a buck and has left him, yeah, has left him with the kids all day. Um, Franny is, I, I think there's something in her, it's very subtle, but I think there's something in her that is worried that if she keeps this child that she uh, may just never get out of this town and might just end up being one of these locals forever. There's this moment where she's looking at all of these empty apartments that are soon to be filled by the swells who swoop into town when it's season. And she's also in the same time thinking when that happens, the guy who's uh, in the, the parking lot attendant will have the lowest IQ in, in, in the city. And, and I think there's a part of her that's, that's worried that she may never get out and might just end up having sealed her fate, uh, being one of these locals forever. Stu Redman never got out of town. Stu Redman is uh, a good old boy who didn't get to go to college because he had to take care of his brother and he let his brother go to college. And so instead he spends his evening at the filling station with, with the boys. And there's this, there's this sense of poverty and the how it impacts the quality of one's life and how it impacts what they believe their own value is also. And it's just so funny to be reading these chapters and realize that none of it's gonna matter. A hill of beans, like everything that, that they're angry about or that they're worried about, what, no matter what, Larry Underwood, he's just finally made it. He has money now, you know? And it's like, whether you have money, whether you don't have money, whether you are, uh, no matter what your job is, it, it doesn't matter. It's all going to come down to the fundamental of your inherent goodness or your lack thereof. And that's all that's gonna, that's all that's gonna matter moving or forward. Or your selflessness, you know? What yeah. you're talking about there is Franny saying, am I gonna get to live my life or am I gonna be stuck taking care of a child now? Totally. And, and Stu, the same sort of thing. He, George Bailey'd himself, you know, from It's a Wonderful Life. He stayed behind to help people out and now he's sort of stuck there. And, um, and Larry Underwood, like you said, what, everything they were worried about is going to go, is going to evaporate. You know, he's worried, is he going to be able to pay his drug bill? What it's done is it's, it's, it's a complete, that is a difference between this and COVID-19 because, you know, here in the stand, it does come down to what are you made of? Are you made of goodness or, or and selflessness or are you yeah. made of selfishness? And well, that's why that line, COVID nineteen, we've got the haves and the have nots in a way. So that's why that line is so important that the that the woman that Larry sleeps with and she shouts at him, "You ain't no nice guy. You ain't no nice guy." Like yeah. he's like, "No, I'm I'm all right. Like I'm all right." But he's not. He's very yeah. selfish. And his journey in the book is to be a better is to be a nice guy is to be a good guy. So. Mike, you have a, a really fascinating uh, look at and a take on reading horror in horrific times. And I, I'm wondering how you are taking reading a book like this in, in the middle of a pandemic. I've heard you say in the past that 
uh, the amazing thing about reading horror in horrific times is that you can close the book and that there's a the end to the book, you know, it, that's not the case with the horrors of real life. How, how has it been different for you reading it this time versus last time? Well, this is, you know, I, I think as, as kind of everybody's acknowledged since we started talking, this is a very unique time to be reading this story. Um, typically, I would feel like a story like this, you know, in, in the same way I think all great horror is a controlled exercise in bravery, you know, that it's about enduring this chapter or this scene or this movie and making it to the credits or closing the book and, and being, you know, 2% braver for it. I, I, I really believe that's the function of, of the genre um, so that we can actually stretch that muscle and, and engage in the real, the horrors of the real world. I, I think there's something unimaginably unique about reading a story whose entire escapist hook at this point anyway, um, in the narrative is about a global pandemic and closing the book to look out the window at the global pandemic. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's an enormously strange experience. It, it, it's like if you were reading it and you put the book down <laughs> And it's like, oh man, that was intense. And then leaned over the, to the demonic clown next to you. And was like, I know, <laughs> right? Like it was really kind of, kind of surreal. What I think is striking me so much about this read on it, um, other than, you know, it's, it's amazing to watch how, how King approaches this story structurally, which I think is incredible that he starts so intimately with Campion and his family. And from there is telling an expansive story that suddenly is introducing this huge ensemble and jumping back and forth among all of them, even if just to touch base with someone while they die. Um, but the feeling I'm getting when I read it is the same feeling I get if I go outside and there's a storm coming and it's, it's that sense of like the static electricity in the atmosphere. And the way he jumps you around the narrative creates that sensation uh, in a way that I think is so neat now because if I go outside I feel like the storm's here <laughs> so it's 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 there, there's a there's a whole extra kind of gear of irony to this experience that's that's never really been part of the story for me before but it didn't really grab me by by the throat and hold on until uh, we got to the eighth chapter which we started to talk about offline right before before with the podcast actually started um and anthony pulled out a quote um from the end of that chapter that uh, was a line that just gave me goosebumps when i read it um and it's it's what, what's what's so amazing about this chapter now is it's just about the spread of a virus and it's seeing how it exponentially um moves from person to person and how one person can become this kind of pyramid chain of infection and it just acts that principle out in a very dispassionate and unemotional way, which was to me horrifying. Um, and it ended on a note where someone infected left a dollar tip for a waitress and Anthony said it right away. The line is, you know, the, the dollar was crawling with death. <laughs> and, um, you know, that these moments in, in the book, uh, when I read it half my life ago, certainly ha did not hit me the way they're hitting me now. Um, and that there is so little difference between a chapter like that um, and the evening news, which has a much higher body count than this story does. Uh, where, we are, where we are right now, you know, in chapter 24, um, the stand hasn't quite caught up to us. It, it hasn't quite caught up to COVID yet. Um, and that to me is, is profoundly strange and, and scary, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's certainly, so, so it, yeah, it kind of works against my big thesis of, of, of what I, what I get from horror, you know, um, of that, that cathartic kind of controlled escape from reality that's meant to arm you for reality. And that's meant to kind of help train you to be just a little more courageous when when it really matters um this is different somehow because it's you know at least so far it's it's worse here than it is in the book um but you know i i do know it's gonna 
thankfully the tables will turn and this will start to feel like escapism really soon. And, and, and I, I felt relieved when Randall Flagg levitated and I was like, oh, thank God, you know, finally, we're getting into some, some magical realism and it's gonna feel a lot less familiar. Um, so that, that, was a, that was a refreshing moment for me of like, oh, thank God we're getting into something less, less us. Uh, can, I, can I add something here? So I'm reading the unexpanded version which is about, I think, maybe 200 pages shorter. At least. Yes. Oh, at least. It's closer to four Maybe 400. Closer to four, re- it's more than 400 pages shorter. Yeah, and uh, chapter 17, when Randall Flagg appears for the first time, uh, he doesn't levitate. He does not levitate in the original version. It ends with, no, he does it not. It ends with, so the whole chapter is about him how he has this jean jacket full of pamphlets and all of the pamphlets are radical pamphlets from the clan to um, like to, the weatherman like, his politics were all over the place. Weatherman, yeah. Well, that was the thing was he didn't, Randall Flagg doesn't have politics. He right. just goes wherever the radicals, wherever the most extreme violence prone people are. And he's kind of a blasting cap for them. Like he, he's even involved in the Patty Hearst, kidnapping and the uh and the assassination of jfk like he has a pamphlet in his pocket that that lee harvey oswald gave him and so you realize he's this low level sort of entity that oh and he went to high school with charlie starkweather like yeah yeah that was a great detail he's like this zeleg like figure who's floating around and only at the end it says because he senses this wave coming right there's this mass death that's coming and he says something like, um, it was almost time to be reborn. He knew. Why else could he suddenly do magic? And that's where the chapter ends. So he doesn't float yet. Um, wow. I don't know if that, does the, maybe the floating comes later. Uh, no, 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 it, no. Was, it was right there. He, yeah. he, he has that thought and then he just kind of lifts off the ground and he's like, this is great. And then he kind of settles back and keeps, <laughs> keeps going. So, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a that's a pretty profound difference right there. Because well, I would that, read that he reminds like, me like, a little bit of uh, magic, or yeah, like that's what you get for reading the short version. Yeah. Anthony. But uh, I want to go back to uh, just, I know. to what. Well, that's what, why I wanted I wanted to read it. I wanted to read it. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, I, I finished that thought because I was going to hear. Well, my I, I, that's why I wanted to read the old version was because I knew you guys are reading the new version. And I was curious where they separate. Another thing that's different is this doesn't start with Campion. It starts with the good old boys in Texas, and he, hmm. huh. he, he just crashes into the pumps. And then the first time, the only time you learn that there is a lab is the government officials who are watching the closed circuit TV and the guy with his face in the soup in the cafeteria right. and all that. Um, uh, but it's interesting what he left out and what, I think a lot of that stuff is really valid and I'm glad it's back in. Um, the it's, it's funny because all I remember, I, I read the original abridged version and then mm-hmm. Steve, <laughs> as we'll call him, came back and published all of the uh, stuff that had been edited out. So I did go back and, and read it right away. But it's funny, all these years later, the only thing I remember being different is like lots and lots of descriptions of burying bodies yeah and clearing out houses like page after page but i wanted to go back to like the, this question of how it feels to read this now and and mike you raised such a good point about how horror is supposed to be that escapism you know that gives us strength to face a world that isn't as bad as the one <laughs> that's in the book and it's a little awkward to try to do that when the world does feel worse than the one in the book. But the one piece of comfort I took from that same chapter you're talking about is how much more virulent, at least, Captain Trips is, right, yeah. than COVID-19. Because I'm one of these people, I'm still wiping down every delivery. I'm dreading my trip to the grocery store tomorrow. I wear the Same. hat, Same. the mask, oh, yeah. I wash my hair, my clothes, the bottoms of my mm-hmm. shoes, everything. So you're can- smart. Yeah, you're, you're, you're like- doing it right. Yeah, it's like the like you you leave the spacecraft and and come back to the chamber where you like you know you get, <laughs> but 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 that chapter when I was reading about how easily it was spreading from person to person, I was like, 
Woo! Well, at least we're not there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, I just saw a study now where, where maybe each infected person is only infecting one other person. Whereas at the beginning of this crisis, it was three other people. And in the stand, it is way more than that. It is like That's literally like 99. 99.4. If you have somebody yeah. with this thing, you are done. The whole diner, like the whole yeah. diner. And I was like, okay, well, whew, thank goodness. Finally, some escapism because... <laughs> It's not quite that bad for us right now. <laughs> yeah. No, then that, that, that's an excellent point. And, and the, the, the moment in the very beginning of this version, which, which Anthony missed out on. Uh, yeah, Anthony. Is, is, uh, <laughs> Anthony um, had to be different. He had to do it his own way. <laughs> uh, exactly. I thought it would be fun to find the differences, too. It is, actually. It, it is. is fun. It is. Oh, that's, that's, it's, so, it's so fascinating to me. It, but uh, Campion, in the beginning, when he's... He, he comes running in to get his wife and his daughter to, to get out uh, of the base because he, he's the only one that knows something's gone wrong and that the virus has gone out. And he says to her uh, before he decides, she says, where are we going? And he said, before I can tell you that, I have, to, I have to check the wind. And he goes out and actually has to decide which direction to drive based on the direction of the wind, which, you know, from a kind of virulent point of view is, is really chilling that this virus is airborne for long distances uh, and can literally be carried to you on the breeze. Um, Spreading on the wind, literally. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that, that you're, you're absolutely right, is, is, is much scarier than what we're really dealing with now in a world where I read something uh, today that said um, something, they're, they're saying it might be as high as 35% uh, of, of all the infected people with COVID may never be symptomatic. Um, and I, I think, you know, that's scary from a transmission perspective, but it's also a bit reassuring that, you know, you've got a one in three chance essentially that you're never gonna feel it, much less be in any, you know, life-threatening danger. It's just more about who you then commun communicate it to uh, that's disturbing. But, but yeah, so, th so there are definitely, there are some, <laughs> some bright spots in but how, and how much more horrible it is in the book here and there. So there's that, there's that to hold on to. Yes, so. well, it's such an interesting parallel too, because, you know, the protagonists are the survivors, you know, the ones who are naturally immune. And being asymptomatic is like a version of, frankly, of being uh, immune, if it's not going to have any impact on you. If you don't know you have it, you might as well not have had it, except that you can spread it, which is horrifying. And that random, that randomizing factor like who gets it, who feels it, who ends up on a ventilator, who only has a couple of weeks of feeling under the weather. It's, you know, it's all over the place in terms of the reports. And, and I've had to really train myself not to, to read those close to bedtime too. So I, I can't read the stand and I can't read the news <laughs> before I go to sleep at night. <laughs> You know, you really should just not bother trying to go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. right I, I, I love listening it. to these two people who made their careers scaring the hell out of people. Like, <laughs> <laughs> how afraid they are. Having you can, a, come on, jump it up. You can do it. <laughs> but I don't know if you all find this is true. I'm with a bunch of horror heads. Having a horror writer's imagination is not oh. helpful. No, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm literally, I, I can't, I'm just like you. I'm wiping down every package I get. I wash my hands. You know, they say you're supposed to wash your hands for like 20 seconds. I wash my hands until my knuckles crack and bleed. Like, I'm not freaking kidding you. Like, I right. really, like, I wash my hands. I've never washed my hands so much in my life. Like, I, I, I wash them three times when I come in just from walking the dog and I had gloves on. Like, it's ridiculous. I just... Because why not? Because why yeah. wouldn't you? Why would you take? Why would you? Why wouldn't you take every possible precaution that that you can? Why wouldn't you wear two masks instead of why? Masks? Indeed. <laughs> why? Indeed. But you know, you know, Even though I, the scariest part of any story is when the storyteller leans into the fire and says, "And it happened not very far from here." <laughs> <You know? laughs> And uh, well, isn't that true? And that's sort of what we're living with with this book. Yes. It happened yeah. not very far from here. You know, I would say it's interesting that you mentioned that scene in particular at the beginning, Mike. That isn't in the uh, that isn't in the uh, original text, and also the the levitation, which isn't in the original text. I and ended up while I was reading it, I went back and forth between the 1990 uncut version and the original first edition, and. I found 
I would say that, I mean, I want to say that there's, in, in what I read in the first 200 pages of the unabridged version in chapters one through 24, I want to say that almost 40 to 50% of it was not in the original. And I tell you, yeah. And I, I think I'll give you three examples. And, you know, cause I keep getting asked also a lot on Twitter, people are saying, which version do you like more or what is the difference between the two? And for me personally, the difference is that the unabridged version is more heartbreaking. Uh, the stuff that was not included, um, Vic's magic hour, uh, Vic Palfrey's magic hour, where he starts to hallucinate after he's been infected with this thing, that's not in there. Uh, he has this sort of, he starts to hallucinate, he starts to hear uh, voices of his mother. Um, and what was so terrifying to me about that also is that, you know, I know a family that, that has recovered from COVID-19 and they were very young. I mean, the, the mother's in her 30s and the father's in his 40s, but he, uh, he did hallucinate. And there were times that he was completely unresponsive when she would speak to him. Um, he was very disoriented. And uh, so that, that just almost brought me to tears. Then there's the, uh, what Steve refers to, if we're all calling him Steve, but what, what, there's, <laughs> there's, what, there's what Steve refers to as the Anne Radcliffe gothic-like moment of um, Franny telling her mother that she's, yeah, that yeah. she's pregnant. That's not in the really? original. No, that's not in oh, the original that, sex either. Well, oh, that's good. It, it, when you talk about how, uh, how Steve can, um, can spin a character's history in a way that makes it so crystal clear kind of who they are and what they're afraid of. I thought that the, it must have been four pages that he gave to Fran's mother's parlor. The oh sitting room. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what that room meant to her, going all the way back to when she was a little girl. Yeah. Um, um, that's that, the kind of King character work that I find so incredible. And it, it makes me sad that Anthony hasn't gotten to enjoy this. Well, um, I, but I Anthony, read it. You've I read, read it before. <laughs> yeah, you just, yeah. Sorry. But you know, Mike, uh -huh. it's, I, I have to ask you too, because there's, there is this long history in film, as I'm sure you're aware of, of mother-daughter scenes on the stairs. And this moment where uh, the mother is so hysterical that she has been slapped in the face by the father. She's on the floor and she gets up and she says, ah, she says, I have to go lay down. And she, she gets on the stairs and she walks and it's, I just keep picturing it as this, what an amazing cinematic moment it would be to have Franny at the bottom of the stairs looking up at her mother who is so hysterical on the top of the stairs and she turns around and King says that she almost, she like wobbles, that there's this yeah, sort she of like, yeah. that she almost just tumbles on down the stairs and she opens her mouth like she's about to say something and just turns around and walks into the bed. And I'm like, this is the most dramatic moment. <laughs> and the, like, this is just ripe for cinema. Like, this is just perfect. Are there any moments like that that you're reading that you're like, damn, I want to shoot that. Like, that would just oh, be so yeah. great to <laughs> Oh yeah, are you kidding? Yeah, no. Um, I mean, Jesus, so many. Uh, it's it's a remarkably cinematic novel, and one of the things that's amazing about it is uh, how cinematically it is edited. Um, you can feel the rhythm of 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 the cut accelerating as you read it, just chapter to chapter. When he chooses to bounce back and forth between different characters, one of the things that did occur to me more than a few times reading this was what a solid job Mick Garris did with his adaptation. Mm. Even with the, the limitations of uh, television budget, which at the time meant something very different than it means now. Um, you know, network standards and practices that forced him to make it acceptable for prime time, um, which meant, you know, this is a PG experience basically um, on a hard R story. Um, there were stretches of the book as I read it that were verbatim, you know, the, the way, he approached them for the adaptation. And that I thought was really impressive. Um, and so, yeah, you know, if, if, if Josh Boone and, and company weren't uh, already 
uh, about to unveil this brand new updated version of, of the stand, which couldn't be more timely. Um, yeah, I would, I would be, I would be all over trying to find a way to be able to, to shoot some of these sequences because it is so remarkably, remarkably cinematic. Um, I, and especially for TV now, you know, that long form storytelling, like, Oh, now is the time. This is, now now is the time. The time. Yeah, yeah totally. golden age of, of long form TV. I, was, I mean, uh, yeah, so I mean, each of these characters, you know, and some of these big moments could be worthy of its own movie. You know what I mean? Like Nick, and the jail yeah. cell and the sheriff and his wife and that whole section where you you walk out and the town has fled or or everyone has died that is that would be a great movie just by itself right? Stu's, <laughs> like uh, Stu Redman's battle of wits with the scientists who resent him for being healthy but are trying to study him right. it's its own three act incredible story um and they got toward the very end of this chunk they left that detail in um, where they say, you know, they actually injected him with the virus. Yeah. They got so sick of him being immune. I, it, was, it was such a beautiful moment. They said, you know, he, they, they got so sick of it. Finally, they just walked up and told him it was a sedative mm. and injected him with the pure form of the virus, like the most potent, you know, Project Blue version of it. And they said, and he killed it without even knowing he had it he just killed it and they don't understand it it's like that that stuff is so great and i that would be a, think of the blumhouse movie that's just inside his that's kind a of story quarantine in and of right? itself it's yeah. still that story like, a story in and of itself i keep pic picturing uh <laughs> this is terrible i keep picturing franny's father as uh william wyndham uh, Seth from Murder She Wrote, the doc, the doctor <laughs> on Murder She Wrote, and I keep and because I'm picturing him now, I realize that I started picturing Franny's mother as Vera Miles in Psycho Two, <laughs> and so I realize that now that my imagination is actually a casting director from 1983. <laughs> I never knew that, um, but there is. I, I feel like the characters in general are just so human and so alive. I mean. Uh, Franny's father has this sort of um, moment where he speechifies on abortion. And I mean, you know, my, my beliefs are very different from his, that's for sure. Like I, like I, I it, but at the same time, his, uh, the way talk about his dead son. That is, yeah, the way that he describes yeah. his dead son. It wasn't like it, an anti-choice thing. It was just like yeah, a, you can't fault him for his right. beliefs. And no, I thought there's there's such a great line in there too, where he says that an old man trying to give a young daughter advice is like a monkey trying to teach table manners to a bear. <laughs> and it's like, but it's like he's that's that's part of coming back to what you said before, Anthony. It's it really is part of what the book is about. I think is this. Um, King has a way of, of having you forgive people of their flaws. And that you, when you know someone's backstory, when you know why they have a belief system that they have, it, doesn't, it starts to not matter if it matches with your own because you understand why they came to that place. And it's, it's not always the case, of course, but it is that certainly the case with his father there. And I, I personally find that Franny's chapters in particular, I have that thing happen to me where uh, it really only can happen to you with a book, I think, where it, you just completely lose yourself. You're just completely lost in this other world. And that, it just sucks me in every chapter with Franny, with Franny's father, with Franny's mother, and even when she's talking to the, to the boyfriend, anything with her, I'm completely lost in. Anthony, is there any character for you that you particularly just end up getting completely lost and in, in, in the middle of of their chapters well he's not the character i would say i like the best but i'm really fascinated by harold lauder because mm. to me he's also i think he has a lot there's a lot about him i think that's relevant now um we'll get to what happens to him later but he's a guy who I think, kind of like Larry, is on the fence between potentially being good, doing some good things, and then his other instincts kick in and he goes the other way. And look, I think this is something that's throughout King's work. Um, 
and and our our two uh, other guests here, Mike and Tanana Reeve, like they've explored this in their own work. Mike and his adaptations of uh, of uh, of Gerald's Game and and uh, Doctor Sleep, uh, but even in The Haunting of Hill House, and, and Tanana Reeve's, uh, you know, in the background there. If you look, she's got her uh, poster for The Good House, which oh, is you a, saw that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really great novel, but like that that book is about a woman who is living with the memory of what is it her is it her grandmother yes, who uh, her grandmother yeah, her grandmother who who lived in this house and had this uh, reputation in town for decency and goodness and helping people and and yet there's this other wave of darkness that can creep in and and in both of in in Doctor Sleep and the Good House like it's about characters who are trying to measure themselves against the past. Am I going mm. to be as good as this person who put, put me on my path? Am I going to be as bad as this person who put me on my path? Like, you know, and I think somebody like Harold is, uh, he's kicked around a little bit by life. He's, he's overweight, he's a nerd. He doesn't really fit in, he's awkward. Some of that's his own doing, some of it's not. And we see him make choices that push him toward the darker side. And I think, uh, I think, one thing King really understands is that people aren't naturally good or evil. They mm. can really push each other uh, and, 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 and follow a little trail of breadcrumbs toward one path or the other. And, and uh, another th a character I, I do not, I, can, I hate to say I like this guy, but like Lloyd Henry. Lloyd's great. Yeah. He and Poke, that scene with Poke and him, uh, you know, Poke has a gun and he's like, I'm going to pokerize you. <laughs> like, yeah. Like those two, well, we're reading it again now, I realize how much of that is drawn from Hunter S. Thompson and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. These two guys cruising down a lonely road in a giant shark-shaped car, just their trunk is full of drugs and they're armed to the teeth. Only these guys are homicidal instead of uh, self-destructive. And uh, how cinematic their robbery scene in that little uh, gas station was That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah, just the shootout and the bubblegum machine exploding and spilling the bu bubblegum balls everywhere. Like, uh, 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 you know, and and Poke getting half his face shot off and and like arguing with the guy who shot him and like it's it's crazy. And then Lloyd walking out uh, and the police are arriving. He's like, oh, I don't know, boy. There's somebody. Yeah. In the back. <laughs> like it was it was like it had that King weirdly funny but like extreme, almost like a Breaking Bad type of tone to it, where it goes so dark that it almost becomes absurd. And you realize that these two guys, the way the story begins, well, they're already, they've already had a kill spree and they've stolen this car, but they, they were just sort of two low level creeps at a, at, a, at, a, at a minimum security penitentiary. And they kind of worked e each other up into a lather. So I think like what we see today, it's not necessarily related to COVID, but it's maybe related to our own political uh, system and, and attitudes is people can work each other up into uh, and bring out the worst in each other. And they can also bring out the best. Mm. And, but, but the worst is easier. It's easier to spark that fire. And I think you bring up a, a wonderful point about how King approaches characters because there isn't an obvious difference in the backstories or in where these characters begin as to who is good or who is bad. And it's not, uh, if we were reading this for the first time and we don't know kind of where the story goes, you can make assumptions throughout that are gonna be wrong about the trajectory of a character. Um, it's never that simple. And I, and I think what I love about the way King approaches all of his characters are that, you know, for the most part, and there are exceptions to this, but for the most part, nobody's just, inherently and explicitly good or bad the difference between the good and the evil characters in his world are, are what they do and you know you can have a character that you have enormous sympathy for all the way up until that inflection point where they make that decision um, and that action makes them a villain um, you know uh, in the same way you can have like Larry's not being set up to be a hero mm -hmm. here you know on a first read you know I, I would guess Larry's on his way to Vegas. Larry's, <laughs> Larry's, Larry's gonna be there partying with Flag, um, but that's not the case. And it's all because of what he does. And this, this upending of expectations with people 
happens even more when when we meet we haven't even met nadine you know who's going to be a, a great example of this for us um who can go either way you know um there's a I hope it's it's in the book because I only remember the scene from the miniseries. But one of the things that struck me even as a kid was when you know Stuart finally meets Mother Abigail, and confesses that he's an atheist. Um, you know, and he says, "I don't believe in God," and she just laughs at him and says, "That's okay. He believes in you, and mm. that's fine with her." You know, like mm. it's it's a really interesting kind of way to upend your expectations for the the traditional heroes and villains. But I think that idea that all of us you know, for the most part in our lives are carrying around very untested virtue. Um, and it, it takes a cataclysmic or catalyzing event like a global pandemic in this case for these characters to really kind of force that decision, to force them to define themselves. The only way we mortal human beings can actually define ourselves, which is by what we do. Uh, and we can say what we believe or what we think we would do or what we would prefer we do, or we can say, I am good or I am bad. And the only thing that ultimately matters is what we what we do. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, King approaches his characters with that empathy in a really profound way. And this book more than, you know, more than almost any other of his that I can imagine uh, well, acts I that out. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And that, that is so true. Um, and it's not just, it's what you do and also sometimes why you do it, right? Because mm -hmm. if, we, if we go back to the scene with Franny and that horrible blow up when she confesses that she's pregnant and her mom freaks out, her mom was wrong to hit her. Absolutely. But also her dad was wrong to hit her mom. You know, I was sort of, I was sort of heartbroken in that moment. And I don't know that it was meant to seem like uh, it was a violation even the way it was written. It was hard to tell um, because all of us are thinking, well, she had it coming, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it's also not okay, right? And, yeah. and, and it made me sad for, for the entire family, for Franny, but also especially for him because I'm sure what a huge disappointment he must have been to himself in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I can only assume, but in terms of which character they all really get under my skin. I sink into Franny's pages. I sink into Nick's pages. But for some reason, both on second reading and in this reading, there's something about Larry. Mm. Um, you know, there's this meme going around now uh, where people say, like, your plans for, for 2020. And then when 2020 hits, like, it's like one photo, you're bright and shiny. And the next photo, you're beat to hell. And this idea that he's just breaking out, mm. <laughs> that he's finally got his hit on the radio when the world <laughs> falls apart there are so many of us <laughs> who feel that way right like i have my first tv episode coming where my husband and stephen barnes and i wrote an episode of the twilight zone that's going to come out thank goodness it was already oh the that's amazing right? congratulations well, thank you thank you well you feel like you're getting like that 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 claw finger hold <laughs> and then hollywood and then disappears you know it's all the doors funny. shut yeah. Everything just disappears. I mean, it will come back, but it's just this moment. It feels so much like what it would be like to be Larry Underwood. You finally have a hit on the radio. He's even just trying to get his life together. So he's trying to move away from the party scene and get himself in order and get psyched up to do his next album, all the things he's supposed to be doing. And none of that, none of that is going to matter. Um, and I want to go back quickly to something you said, Anthony, about uh, the casual racism in, in yeah. some of the characters. And thank you for bringing that up because I don't know how I reacted as a teenager. I think back when I read it, I often was just happy if black people were acknowledged that we exist. <laughs> so, so I don't remember jarring at the N word so much as I do now, because now we're in more sensitive times and I just didn't remember like so many of the characters being casually racist. But the moment that Larry came through for me was when his mom had used the N word and then he didn't, have an immediate reaction but later on he he had an internal um, memory of this mom's bigotry so that to me is a signal oh okay he notices too he doesn't like it either you know we're in this together kind of yeah. thing <laughs> so so there is a judgment there's a judgment attached to it rather than it just sort of being color that's not commented upon you know these are colorful characters and this is how they think and talk but larry does you know at least make a slightly anti-racist uh, sort of uh, thought there when he's thinking about his mom. But at the same time, having had a very close relationship with my mother, 
those scenes where Larry is trying to navigate that very prickly relationship he has with his mom and trying to reach for his better angels um, and the conflict between, as, as you guys were saying, who we are and who we want to be, all of that is really, really strong for me in, in Larry's sections. You know, we all want to feel like we're the hero in somebody's story. But, you know, if you've lived a while, you've had some moments where you have been the villain in somebody's story. It's not a moment you're proud of, but we all have that thing we wince when we think about. And, and who are we really? You know, how do, how do we overcome those flaws and our selfishness and all those things about us that, that, that our moms remind us? You know, you're a taker. You're a taker, Larry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I do that. Another scene, by the way, that's not actually in the original text, that scene where Larry's mom uh, tells him finally at work what she really thinks of him is not mm. in the original text. I would, oh. say, I would say that scene, the scene with Franny's mom and the scene with Vic Palfrey where he's having the hallucinations are the three moments in the first 24 chapters that made me actually like choke up and want to cry. Like my eyes like welled up with tears as I was reading them. And I just thought, how is it possible that these had to be excised from the original because it's, to me, it, it's a much more heartbreaking version of the story to have those moments in there. What I think is interesting about him and uh, is the relationship with parents at the start of this and losing them, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there are very few people who, and I don't think any, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, who lose their children, right? It's all people who lose the older generation. I guess, I guess Stu had a, had a stillborn baby and, and really doesn't have anybody left. Um, and they, and they, they talk about kind of children of characters you don't get to know well. Right? Yeah, you know, oh, who, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, right. yeah. Of the, of the survivors, of the immune right. people. There's nobody who like loses their whole family and uh, you know, they're all sort of loners in a way. Yeah. And I think, interesting. I think of King's history, you know, if you guys have read the short story, The Woman in the Room, about which he wrote about his mother dying from cancer. And, and I think it's sort of well known that his, he didn't have a father. He and his brother were raised by a single mom. The dad did one of those, I'm going out and never came home things. And I think, and I, you know, from all I've read and, and in earlier interviews with him, the, the death of his mother, when that's the only person you have in your life, really affected him. And then he has this, uh, what I imagine is a notion of his father, at least, who abandoned them, right? So you often have one parent who means everything, like Franny and her, fa and her father, and then there's Franny and her mother, who she has this super hostile feeling toward, yeah. and Larry and his mother, who there's a little bit of ambivalence, but he really does care about her and will want her to be happy and want her to respect him. Um, but then these characters lose that person. They lose their mooring, and they're forced to go out into the world and figure figure things out and I can't help but think that his own experience must have played a part in this what happens when it's just you two and you lose that person you know yeah. got to be scared and also on that topic um with COVID being that so much more dangerous to elderly populations and, mm -hmm. and the kinds of horrible infection rates we're seeing in nursing homes and assisted living facilities that notion of separation like where you literally can't see that parent, uh, if they're in the hospital, if they're in a facility, uh, burials having to be done remotely, all the real life horror, right, is, is mirrored with that sense of losing uh, your moorings with your family and your parents in, in the stand too. Absolutely, great point. You know, if I'd, if I'd known better, I would have had us end on chapter 23 instead of chapter 24, because that really is where we first encounter Randall Flagg. And this, that chapter just is, it's sheer poetry. Like, and it makes sense that it would be poetry too, because Randall Flagg was born of a poem. Uh, it, it originated, the idea of Flagg originated from a poem that King wrote in 1969 called uh, the Dark Man. Now, did anyone for extra credit read either The Dark Man or King's short story about Captain Tripp's Night Surf before Dr. Oh. Sam? No. no. Anthony. Yeah, that's, uh, it's a short story from Night Shift. Yeah. And I don't remember it that vividly. I remember it being one of the weaker ones out of that. 
out of that book, but um, almost like a little, just, it's almost like a little addendum to the stand. It's just people hanging out at the beach, right? And they're talking about Captain Trips taking people yeah, away. And pretty much it. Like last, last dance at the, uh, before the lights go out yeah. <laughs> like at a party. Yeah, it's totally true. It is though, it is uh, that chapter I found to be, it's completely unlike anything else that you've read in the book so far. It is, I mean, there's a lot of moments that King writes throughout the stand that are very poetic, but that entire chapter is, you know, there's this, um, the uh, first edition that came out. By the way, does anyone ever, did anyone ever notice the fact that uh, this never actually happens <laughs> in the story? <laughs> like, who are those people? And I mean, we know, <laughs> we know who they are, but like, it it's, looks good good for, it's, it's good versus, well, speaking of it looking good too. The other thing that I thought of recently, because I was like, gosh, this is such a great cover. And then it suddenly dawned on me. I was like, wait a minute, when was this book written? And, or when was it published? And I think that it was first published in 78? 78, I think it okay, was. So how much does this look like a blockbuster, well, you can't see it, from 1977 called Star Wars? How much does this person oh, look yeah, like? Good point. This That's is good. A, how much does this person That's look? That's Luke Skywalker against Darth Vader. Yeah, on well, Tatooine. Yeah, yeah, on Tatooine <laughs> with the big desert in the background. I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, I wonder if this came out right after what was the biggest movie in the history of the world at the time. And I'm sure that the marketing department was like, well, this is going to sell real well. That's super smart. But the back of the book, the back of the book actually has this, um, it has two paragraphs um, with... Uh, that are taken from from that Randall Flag, um, from that Randall Flag chapter. I just wanted to read the back of the book here for a second, it, and also it sort of we're wrapping things up here, and I want to give Steve the um, final word on the matter too. So this is this is from that chapter, and it says, Randall Flag, the dark man, strode south on U.S. 51, listening to the night sounds that pressed close on both sides of this narrow road that would take him sooner or later out of Idaho and into Nevada. From Nevada, he might go anywhere. It was his country, and none knew or loved it better. He knew where the roads went, and he walked them at night. He hammered along, arms swinging by his sides. He was known, well known, along the highways in hiding that are traveled by the poor and by the mad, by the professional revolutionaries, and by those who have been taught to hate so well that their hate shows on their faces like hair lips. And they are unwelcome, except by others like them, who welcome them to cheap rooms with slogans and posters on the wall, to basements where lengths of sawed-off pipe are held in padded vices while they are stuffed with high explosives, to back rooms where lunatic plans are laid to kill a cabinet minister, to kidnap the child of a visiting dignitary or to break into a boardroom meeting of standard oil with grenades and machine guns and murder in the name of people. He was known there, and even the maddest of them could only look at his dark and grinning face at an oblique angle. The women he took to bed with him, even if they had reduced intercourse to something as casual as getting a snack from the refrigerator, accepted him with a stiffening of the body a turning away of the countenance. Sometimes they accepted him with tears. They took him the way they might take a ram with golden eyes or a black dog. And when it was done, they were cold. So cold, it seemed impossible they could ever be warm again. It's poetry. It is absolute poetry. It feels completely different to me than a lot of the other chapters that we've read so far. Did you feel that it was different in any way, just in the terms of its prose? Yeah, totally agree. It, it, it leaves out, I think, because of how matter of fact everything that precedes it is, which is, I think, part of what makes it so propulsive. And, and so now that you've introduced this character, who's the first character on screen who wasn't a human being, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that, yeah, like you said, the poetry is starting to poke out um, because I, I was struck by him, especially in the early chapters, it is very 
uh, very clinical. It's just, and then they did this and then they did that, which is still wonderful. It's, it's wonderfully written, but it's, it's keeping an arm's length to, to a lot of it from a, you know, from a writing point of view, I think maybe because he's killing the world. So you can't swim in its poetry and then kill it. It's funny. I um, noticed that. I noticed that too. I noticed that there's, there's a lot of, uh, he, he, he doesn't get real, um, uh, highfalutin with his he, it's very no nonsense prose yeah. uh, in 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 many in many areas like i i found whole paragraphs where it was just short sentences explaining what was happening and as a writer that struck me i was like that's interesting that he can do that and then in the process of that almost like in the process of what's probably i'm gonna guess like a stream of consciousness sort of just short sentence this happened and this happened and this happened and that happened eventually in there somewhere there's one sentence that's just sheer poetry but it's like yeah, yeah. Well, it only takes one you know like you don't have to make every single sentence like something that's you know expounding on 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 more than is necessary it's it's very well, no it is it is it's a huge turning point uh in the story this is our first wholly supernatural character right we've had hints of dreams up to this point but this is the first time we're seeing what is the difference between a long novel, which is a novel with great, very well drawn characters and deep into their lives and an epic novel, which is what the stand is because all of this characterization and even the plague is just a backstory leading to this larger story uh, with, with Flag at the center of it. So it has a lot of weight on its shoulders. It's sort of steering this ship toward um, what this novel is really about. Yeah, very true. I think it, it's interesting you draw that comparison between, or that distinction between the prose of the Randall Flagg chapter, because King does this thing often in his works that I think is really kind of fun, where he, he throws in something that banal, or almost, uh, a, almost commercial-like. Uh, he'll mention a product or a TV show that really seems, make it, you know, it's a contrast in absurdity to whatever seriousness is going on. You know, like, when Larry is walking through New York and looking through the uh, store windows at the TVs that are on and like CBS has like a test pattern up and then there are just a bunch of other like sitcoms that are just clearly whatever tape they had that they could run just to fill the airtime. And uh, I forget the shows that he mentioned, but it's all pretty, it's all like pretty silly stuff. And then there's this sequence where uh, Poke and, and Lloyd are having their shootout in the, uh, in the um in the in the the gas station and he describes shooting the cowboy like the the patron who just has a gun i guess the good guy with the gun who pops out to try to settle things and um you know uh lloyd ends up shooting him and it says like he put three bullet holes in the cowboy's khaki shirt and most of his innards exited from the back to splatter a budweiser sign that showed the world famous clydesdales and i thought most writers would end with sprayed the Budweiser sign, but he adds that showed the world famous Clydesdales. And it's just like a little like, oh yeah, you know, this thing that we see on TV or in ads all the time, like it just grounds it in a way and puts it in your face. And, and the, the Randall Flagg chapter comes in and it's got this almost scripture-like grandiloquence to it that you realize all those little details that he threads through are to make it feel like this is our world, this is the real world. Uh, this is the 7-Eleven, not a gothic castle far away. But then it, here comes this gothic element that feels very different tonally. It's got that Ray Bradbury prose, you know, that's really going deep, uh, reaching for some sort of depth. And, and, and it, it almost reminds me of the comic books. Whenever Thor speaks, it's in a different, it's like in a more fancy font because it, it, it projects his accent, you know? And... Uh, it's like, so it's the opposite of what King does. And he does it in the, in the Dark Tower books too. It's another world. So he writes in a different style. There's not this casual reference to pop culture or to products. You know, I think it's kind of cool. It's amazing. Mike, Tanana Reeve, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. Next month, we'll be discussing chapters 25 through 42, which will take us all the way through the end of book one. You can get notified of when new episodes go live by subscribing at thestandpodcast.com. You'll also find links to Tanana Reeve Dew's online course, My Horror Fiction, 
and Anthony Bresnikin's first look at CBS's The Stand for Vanity Fair. And as we close today's episode, The Stand podcast asks you to take a stand. We urge you to help New York City's first responders of the COVID-19 pandemic. The EMS FDNY Help Fund helps first responders battling medical issues, debilitating injuries, and personal tragedies. During this unprecedented pandemic, it is unfortunate but inevitable that some first responders will become infected with the virus. And when that happens, we need to be there for them. The EMS FDNY Help Fund is providing the vital gear and supplies to protect emergency medical technicians, paramedics, and other first responders for the city of New York. Your financial contribution can ensure the welfare of the city's finest heroes who put their lives on the line every single day in the epicenter of this pandemic. Go to thestandpodcast.com, scroll down, and make a donation today. Don't wait. Don't do it tomorrow. Don't do it 10 minutes from now. Do it right now. Go to thestandpodcast.com, scroll down, and give whatever you can. Until next time, remember the place where you make your stand doesn't matter, only that you do and that you're still on your feet. <laughs>